Hello fellow adventurers and welcome back to another episode of Word Safari. In this safari we're going to look at a very interesting set of words in the English language and those are words that are related to numbers. We're going to start by looking at a few generic words before looking at the actual words for numbers starting with 10 and counting down throughout this episode and the next episode. So let's begin uh, with the word for count. Since we're talking about numbers, we count numbers. Where does this word count come from? Well, it comes from French as with many words as we've seen in the English language. This is a borrowing from Old French. Uh, and their verb for to count was conte, but that comes from Latin, and as is often the case with words in French, it represents an eroded or shortened form of a longer Latin word. And even if you don't know Latin, I guarantee you will recognize this Latin word because we also borrowed a word from it, or several words from it. Uh, that word in Latin was computare, and this was a word that uh, was a compound, like many words we've seen in Latin. So con means with or together. Putare is a verb that means to count or to think or to consider or to reckon. It can mean anything in that general sphere. So to compute literally means to, to count up, to count together, to reckon, to consider, to figure out. It can mean any of those things. Of course, we got our verb compute and our noun computer straight from Latin. So it didn't go through that process uh, of erosion in Old French. So it's interesting that we get count through Old French from computare, but we get compute and computer straight from Latin. So those are actually related to each other. Uh, how about the word number? Since we're talking about numbers, let's talk about the word number. Uh, something similar happened. It came through Old French from Latin. Uh, in Old French, it was nomere. Uh, that's probably about how it would have been pronounced, and that just meant number, but that comes from the Latin word numerus. So a similar thing has happened where Old French has changed the Latin word somewhat, um, and we get both the French word and something directly back from the Latin into English today. So we get number as the noun, one, two, three, four, five, these are numbers numbers, but then we get adjectives like numeral uh, and other things from Latin numerus. Uh, these co both come from the Indo-European root nel, which is a root that means to distribute or to apportion. Uh, so you can see why a word that means number in Latin numerus comes from this root and it means thing you use to apportion uh, one, two, three, four, five. So you can see that that makes sense semantically. Another word we have for number in English is digit. Digit comes straight from Latin digitus. It didn't go through Old French, and that's why it looks so much like the Latin. Uh, digitus in Latin literally means finger, not number. But of course, we, uh, and especially our ancestors, have counted numbers with their 10 fingers, which is one reason we have a base 10 numbering system. Uh, so you can see why a word for finger and a word for number might be conflated. Uh, ultimately, this comes from the Indo-European root date. Uh, date means to show or to point out. So a digitus is literally something you point something out with, literally maybe point something out with. Um, it's connected to a word we have from Latin like indicate. Indicate comes from in, dec, which comes from this root, plus a past participle ending there, that atum, which literally means to point out. So when you indicate something, you might use your digit to point it out, and, and the etymology is all very closely related when you do that and say it that way. All right. Let's go on and start talking about the actual number terms. Uh, as I alluded to earlier, we are going to have a countdown where we are going to start with the number 10 and we are going to count down all the way to the number one. And this is going to take us two episodes. So we are only going to get halfway through during this particular safari. Uh, number terms are really interesting because they can tell us a lot about the past. Uh, in other words, when we look at them, we can try to figure out what they used to be and learn about certain things that have happened in the history of the evolution of our language, which of course for this uh, channel is all about English, even though we're talking about a lot of other languages that English gets words from. Uh, one of the reasons that number terms are so useful when we're trying to do what we call historical linguistics, which is the process of looking at language change throughout history, that's why it's called historical linguistics, uh, is that numbers tend to be consistent over time. In other words, languages rarely replace or borrow them. There are many other words in the English language, as we've Seen, they get borrowed. They get borrowed from French. They get borrowed from Latin. They get borrowed from Greek. They get borrowed from somewhere. A lot of English has actually been borrowed from somewhere. But when we're really wanting to understand the basics and the deep history of the English language, we want to try to look at those words that have been in the language as long as possible. They weren't just borrowed from French less than a thousand years ago, because that's only going to tell so much about the English language. Numbers are great because they rarely get borrowed. Every once in a while, you'll have a language that will borrow some number terms. Uh, but for the most part, numbers tend to be very 
very consistent uh, over time in a particular language because why would you need to borrow number terms from, from some other language if you already know how to count from 1 to 10. Uh, another reason that these are good to use to learn the history of a language is that they have little semantic variability. Uh, one of the things that can be devilous as we're trying to reconstruct terms is that they can change meaning and then that can affect the way that we are looking at them and, uh, and, and what we can do with them. But numbers are very consistent in their semantic content, uh, not just in the fact that they're going to be there in the language and probably not be borrowed, but they're consistent in their semantic content too. One's probably going to mean one, two's probably going to mean two, three is probably going to mean three, although within some, some boundaries, in other words, there are certain things you can do with numbers, especially like one, that we're going to see uh, a little later on, actually in the next safari when we get to the number one. Uh, but generally speaking, they're pretty consistent semantically. Uh, so when you put all this together, numbers provide an unusually clear window into language evolution. So as we're doing this countdown from 10 to 1 uh, for the rest of this episode and on into the next episode, I'm going to be using this to, to talk about some principles of historical linguistics and how we think we can know anything about any words that anybody said four, five, six thousand years ago, if they never wrote them down, if they didn't have tape recorders, how do we how do we know what those words might have sounded like? I'm going to try to show you, you know, give you a little bit of a behind the scenes uh, peek as to how we do this kind of uh, thinking and this kind of research. Let's start with the number 10. So the number 10 comes from uh, Proto-Germanic. This is not a French borrowing. As I've said, all of our number words are, are, are English native words that we got from the depths of our Germanic past. Now, just a brief summary of what Proto-Germanic is. I know we've talked about this a little bit. But Proto-Germanic is the uh, language from which all of the modern Germanic languages evolved. So we have English, we have German, we have the Scandinavian languages minus Finnish, uh, we have Icelandic, which counts as a Scandinavian language, Danish, Dutch, some other dialects, but those are the Germanic languages. We comprise a language family, and one of the things, really the main thing, that makes a group of languages comprise a language family is that they have a common ancestor, just like your biological family is a family, probably because you have a biological biological ancestor. Obviously, there's adoption and things like that. But generally speaking, we use biological metaphors to talk about language, and it works pretty well um, because languages evolve just like biological organisms do. Languages are related to each other just like biological organisms are. So we can do uh, some language reconstruction and find out that in Proto-Germanic, uh, which was probably spoken around 2,500 years ago, the language that English, German, and the other ones that I mentioned uh, descended from, the word for 10 was a little bit longer. It was probably like tehun instead of 10. And H is a pretty weak consonant. Um, it falls out of a lot of languages, and then the vowels around it might contract, and that's exactly what happened in the history of English. Tehun just became 10, and that's how we get our number 10. But as you can see, it's not really very different. So I've alighted over some of this to get back to some of the really interesting stuff. So this language, Proto-Germanic, was itself the daughter of an older language, just like English is the daughter, when we do use biological terms for this, just like English was the daughter of Proto-Germanic, Proto-Germanic was the daughter of a language called Proto-Indo-European, which we have talked about uh, somewhat uh, in some other episodes on this channel. Uh, the interesting thing about Proto-Indo-European is that it had many daughters. Um, it was very productive. Greek was one of its daughters. Latin was one of its daughters. As we know, the Romance languages are daughters of Latin. So the Romance languages are, uh, are distant relatives uh, from an English perspective. So we can look at other words in the Indo-European family, other, other words for 10, and compare them and try to see if we can figure out what the word for 10 might have been in that older language, Proto-Indo-European, which was probably spoken five to six thousand years ago. Now, we're going to be doing this kind of like you would with, with, with a biological family. If you see uh, three or four brothers and sisters, you might kind of have an idea of what their parents might have looked like, given some common traits that they have, uh, hair color, skin color, eyes, facial shape, all sorts of things that you might be able to infer about what their parents look like. We can kind of do the same thing with languages. So let's let's look at the words for 10 in Greek, which, uh, which is deca, there it is, and Latin, which is decem. Cs are always hard, like a K sound in Latin. So deca and decem are the words for 10 in Greek and Latin, respectively. And as you can see, those two look very similar, uh, even though those, those are not necessarily very similar languages. Otherwise, they are, are both members of the Indo-European family. Um, they have conservative uh, words for 10. In other words, they haven't changed them much. So if we just look at Greek and Latin, we would probably think that the word for 10 in Proto-Indo-European looked something like deck and then 
maybe something at the end that we would have to figure out. But as you can see, that doesn't really look anything like what we think was the word for 10 in Proto-Germanic, which was tehun or something very similar. So how do how do we go from here? How do we proceed? Do we just throw up our hands and say, well, I guess we'll never know? Or, or can we use some principles to try to figure out what that word for 10 might have been and why it looks different in Proto-Germanic versus Greek or Latin? That's what we're going to be talking about here shortly. Let's talk about sound laws. Sound laws sounds like something really formal, but it doesn't have anything to do with a courtroom or you getting arrested or a judge or anything like that. Uh, sound laws are laws by which languages and specific languages within language families change their sounds. And they're called laws because they're pretty reliable. So over time, languages evolve in many ways. Um, they can evolve their words, different words. We've been saying this a lot on Word Safari, how, how English has evolved its vocabulary a lot by taking words from other languages. Languages. Um, it can evolve its syntax, in other words, the, the order you put words in, um, and it can evolve in many other ways too, but the most reliable and reconstructable form of evolution is in the sound system, and the reason is that when sound systems evolve, they, they almost never evolve randomly, uh, unlike words, where a word might get evolved, uh, uh, rather borrowed from some particular language, and, and you couldn't have predicted that, and since you couldn't predict it, you can't necessarily go back in time and figure out exactly where something came from unless you already know that language and you know there is historical contact. Otherwise, you might never know for sure. Uh, with, with, with sound systems, however, since sound evolution follows certain laws, we can oftentimes undo it with a certain degree of confidence, unlike other types of evolution. So the way that we can figure out sound laws is doing exactly what we were doing on the last slide. We can compare cognate terms, in other words, terms that are related to each other, that come from a common ancestor, in, in, in related languages within a particular family. So Indo-European is a great language family we can do this with because, again, Indo-European has so many daughters that give us so much data that we can look at and compare the words across all of the Indo-European languages for, for a word like 10 and try to figure out where the mutations happen. Again, we use a lot of biological terms because it makes sense. Where did the mutations happen in certain branches of the family where certain sounds mutated and became other sounds? Now, the important thing Thing about sound laws is that once you figure one out, it's reliable. It's not just going to happen for one word in the family. It's going to happen for all the words in the family that have those particular sounds. So, so it's really useful if you can figure out a sound law because you can then apply it to other words in the family even if you weren't even looking at those or thinking about those originally. Um, here's a basic example sound law. All P sounds, and by the way, when something is in brackets like that, um, that's, that's, a, that's, that's uh, from the International Phonetic Alphabet, or IPA, um, and it's describing, it's, it's trying to indicate that this is the way a sound particularly sounded like. Um, so all P sounds in Proto-Indo-European became F sounds in Proto-Germanic. This is an example of a sound law because notice it's saying that a particular mutation happened, a sound mutation happened in one particular branch of the Indo-European family. All of the words with the, the sound P in them in Proto-Indo-European, as, as Proto-Indo-European evolved down through time into Proto-Germanic, there was, there was a mutation that happened where all the P's became F's. And if you know that sound law, it's predictable. If you see an F in Proto-Germanic, you don't have to guess where it came from. It came from P in Proto-Indo-European because there were actually no F sounds in Proto-Indo-European at all. All the F's in Proto-Germanic came from P's in Proto-Indo-European. Uh, the sound laws sometimes do have exceptions, but the good news is that those exceptions can usually also be described by rules. So we can we have sort of of subsidiary rules that can modify the bigger rule. So here's an example of a subsidiary rule, an exception to the last sound law that, I, that, I, that we were just talking about. P sounds in Proto-Indo-European that were right after an S did not change to F in Proto-Germanic. In other words, they just stayed P. They didn't change to anything, they just stayed P. So if you have a word in Proto-Indo-European that starts with a P, it's going to start with an F in Proto-Germanic. But if you have a word in Indo-European that starts with SP, S -P, it's still going to start with SP or SP in Proto-Germanic. So you can see that that's an exception to the first rule, but it's a rule-governed exception to the first rule. So if you know both of these rules, you can predict what any word is going to look like. If I give you a word in proto 
Indo-European, you can tell me what it will look like in Proto-Germanic. Also, you can go the other way. If I give you a word in Proto-Germanic, you can undo this law and tell me what it's going to look like in Proto-Indo-European. So this is how historical linguistics works. This is how we are able to uh, figure out with a pretty high degree of accuracy, we think, what a particular word or family of words might have sounded like in a language that, that nobody ever wrote down, and nobody ever recorded or anything like that. But we're pretty sure we know because of sound laws. Let's talk about one particular sound law that's going to be really important in the number terms that we're going to be talking about uh, for the rest of this episode and then on into the next one. Grimm's Law is one of the most famous sound laws uh, that has ever been discovered. It was named after its discoverer or kind of co-discoverer, Jakob Grimm. He was a man who lived about 200 years ago. He's probably more famous for being one of the brothers Grimm who wrote the fairy tales. So he was interested in literature and linguistics. And back then, people were usually interested in multiple things and didn't just specialize in one thing. So Grimm's Law what was a sound law that was discovered by this one particular guy, Jakob Grimm. Uh, we think that Grimm's law took place around the time of Proto-Germanic, around 500 BC. And the reason that we think it took place then is that it, 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 it affected all of the Germanic languages. So it didn't happen after one of the Germanic languages split off from the other ones. It happened while they were all still together. This particular mutation happened while they were all still together. Uh, again, principles of biological evolution apply here, where if you have a mutation that affects everybody in a particular family, it probably happened while they were still, uh, while, while they still a common ancestor and not afterwards. So we're using some of those same principles here. Um, you have to know Grimm's Law to be able to accurately compare words in the Germanic languages with words from other Indo-European languages that are not the Germanic languages. So if you want to compare the word for 10, like we're doing here, with, uh, with the word for 10 in, in Spanish or French or Latin or Greek, or, or, or any other language in the Indo-European family, pretty much. You have to know Grimm's Law because Grimm's Law is going to be the mutation that you have to take into account when you are looking at the Germanic data specifically. So let's briefly, briefly go over what happens in Grimm's Law. Um, there's going to be some linguistic jargon here, um, but, but I'm going to try to explain it. And also, there won't be a test. So don't worry if, if some of this is over your head because you're going to see it in action here pretty soon, all right? Um, first of all, voiceless style top consonants in Proto-Indo-European became voiceless fricatives in Germanic. Let me explain what I mean by that. Uh, voiceless means you don't, you're not vibrating your vocal cords. Voiced means you are vibrating your vocal cords. So is a voiceless sound because you don't vibrate your vocal cords when you're saying that particular sound. And you can tell because you can, you can as I was just doing, uh, you can put your fingers right here on your, uh, your voice box. So what is a stop consonant? It's a, it's a consonant that you stop the air very briefly and then you blow it out in a puff from your mouth. So P is a stop consonant because you, you say P and you stop the air and then blow it out. That's all a stop consonant is. So, so, uh, so it's not very fancy once you understand it. A fricative is a kind of consonant where you don't stop the air completely. You let it keep blowing through. Fricative comes from a Latin word that means to rub. So the air like rubs through like that. S is a very classic fricative. F is another classic fricative. Uh, okay, so P's became F's. P's are stop consonants. F's are fricatives. Uh, and they're both voiceless. So any P that was in Indo-European is going to become an F in Proto-Germanic. This is the sound law that I just gave you as an example a few slides ago. P's become F's. T's become thuz because th is the corresponding voiceless fricative to the voiceless stop. Chub. Notice that I wrote that in brackets because I didn't give you the uh, the IPA symbol because I didn't want to make it too complicated. Brackets basically means this is how we write it. This is not from I, the, uh, from the IPA uh, annotation system. So P became F, T became Th, and K originally became H, a sound that we often write with CH in languages like Scottish, Scottish Loch, Loch Ness, or Loch Ness, or something like that. Um, so originally K would have become H, but then H simplified to a H sound, just a regular H in a lot of the Germanic languages. So we often say as shorthand that K became H, but there was an intermediary uh, step there where, where it was H. Uh, one great example uh, of this uh, that actually has two instances of, instances of Grimm's Law in it uh, is, is the word for father in the New European. The word for father was pater. It was still pater in both Latin and Greek. We get a lot of words like paternal uh, from, from this word for father in Latin and Greek. But if you apply Grimm's Law to it, you get the Germanic word for father. And in this case, the English word for father. P became pho, 
T became th, and originally this would have been fathar, uh, although there's actually a, another law coming that we're going to talk about that complicates this a little bit. Um, notice we don't pronounce it like fathar today. We pronounce it father, which is a slightly different th sound, if you've ever thought about that. But either way, it does undergo Grimm's law, and that's very important to look at. So you can see that once you know Grimm's law, you can see pater and father are the exact same word, uh, even though they don't necessarily look anything alike. But if you know that mutation, then, then you can see the connections very quickly. Uh, let's briefly talk about the rest of Grimm's Law. The, this, this slide is not as important as the last one as far as what we're going to be talking about as far as number terms, um, but voiced stop consonants, so b -d -g became voiceless stop consonants in Proto-Germanic. So Indo-European b became uh, Germanic p, Indo-European d became Germanic t, Indo-European g became Germanic k. Pretty simple, okay. Indo-European then also had a series of uh, aspirated voiced stops. So these are like b. We, we're not 100% sure how these would have been pronounced, but it was probably a b with some kind of puff of aspiration or something like that. These actually just simplify to the unaspirated variants in Germanic. So b, which we usually write bh, just became a regular b. D, which we usually write dh, just became a regular d. And g, which we usually write GH, just became a regular G. So you can see all, all three of these uh, sets together all comprise Grimm's Law. And there's actually, I've simplified it here because I didn't want to make this longer than it needed to be for what we're talking about here. Um, again, feel free to pause this, uh, go back to the last slide if you want to review. Uh, but you might want to keep watching and see what we do with this and then come back and review because it might help you to, to see uh, Grimm's Law in action with a few more words as we look at them. So let's go back to the word for 10. We saw the word for 10 uh, is contracted from the Proto-Germanic word tehun. Uh, so now that we know a little bit more about Grimm's Law, what can we do with this? If we want to go further back in time from the Proto-Germanic uh, tehun, we have to undo Grimm's Law because we know that it would have undergone Grimm's Law. So how do we undo, uh, undo Grimm's Law? We have to think about what T would have come from and we have to think about what H would have come from. Uh, if you go back to those slides we were just talking about, we know that T came from D and we know that H came from k. So what that t is actually telling us is that there was a d there in Proto-Indo-European. And what that h is actually telling us is that there was a k there in Proto-Indo-European. So this is actually telling us this word was something like dekun or de something like that. We uh, reconstruct this word in Proto-Indo-European, the word for 10, as dekum. Uh, the, the circle under the M means that it's actually a vowel M and not a consonant M. So this is decum. It's the sound you make when you say m. Mm. That's M as a vowel and not M as a consonant. This also accounts for the Latin and the Greek data that we saw, decum and deca, respectively, because there are some sound laws that we don't need to worry about in Latin and Greek that tell us the outcome of that, that, that uh, vowel M. Basically, it's going to end up as an un sound in Germanic. It's going to end up as an M, which, we, which was spelled E-M in Latin. And it's going to end up as an A, which is spelled alpha or a in Greek. Uh, of course, uh, the Spanish and the French both come from this Latin decum. So just to throw in a few other uh, widely spoken Romance languages today, you can see they haven't changed it from Proto-Indo-European quite as much as we have in English, but that's because they did not undergo Grimm's Law. So they still have a D there, um, and they did some things to the K. As you can see, neither of them has a K sound in it anymore. So that's, that's a really brief introduction to uh, historical linguistic methodology. That's how we try to reconstruct a word like that Proto-Indo-European word for 10, decum, that, that we can have a fair degree of confidence in just by looking at the data that we have, all the data that you can see on this slide, understanding Grimm's Law, and then applying Grimm's Law to the data. Let's go on. Let's keep going with the countdown. Uh, let's talk about the number nine. The number nine is actually not the most interesting number when it comes to historical linguistics because it does not undergo Grimm's Law at all because uh, there's no p, t, k, b, d, g sounds. Those are the stop constants we are talking about uh, in the number nine. This is from the Proto-Germanic word niwun. Nine is just a contraction from niwun. The W fell out and then it contracted around it to what would have been nin originally. And then the Great Vowel Shift happened and it changed to nine. So we can reconstruct niwun as the Proto-Germanic word uh, for nine. Uh, if we compare the Latin, it's pretty similar. No wem, uh, the, the, the V sound, or rather the V letter in Latin was a W sound. So no wem is how that would have been pronounced. You can see no wem and niwun are not that different. Uh, so we don't have too much uh, difficult work to do uh, as far as reconstruction here. Um, of course, Spanish, nueve, 
and French neuf both come from this Latin word noem with their with their own sound laws uh, that, that we don't need to go into. Uh, interestingly, when we look at the Greek, we get a little bit of a complication because the Greek word for nine does look a little bit different. It's enea with, with two ends and a whole other syllable in front of the first end. So that's a little bit complicated. What's going on there? Uh, without going too far into Greek sound laws or even uh, laws of Proto-Indo-European, we're pretty sure that there was originally another sound on the front of the word for nine, and Greek is, is cluing us into that. Um, Proto-Indo-European had sounds called laryngeals. We're not 100% sure what they sounded like, but they were some kind of throaty sound. Um, we're pretty sure that there was a laryngeal on the front of the word for nine in Proto-Indo-European. So uh, we, we reconstruct something like noun for the word for nine in Proto-Indo-European. But as you can see, that looks pretty similar to nine today. It looks pretty similar to no limb. And it also explains the, uh, the uh, weird first syllable there in Greek. There used to be a laryngeal there. Let's go into eight. Eight is more interesting because we're going to get back to Grimm's Law here with the number eight. Now, of course, eight, you can see we spell it that way today, but that G-H is an old, is a, is a Middle English way of spelling some kind of a throaty kind of sound uh, in, uh, in Middle English and going back to Old English. It comes from the Proto-Germanic ach. Uh, Octo, uh, which we can spell with an H, but this is the outcome of Grimm's Law, so it could have been H, it could have been H, um, it, 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 we're not entirely sure, but either way, that's how we spell it, Octo, Octo, that's about how we, we think it would have been pronounced. Now, when we compare it to the Latin and Greek data, the Latin word for eight is Octo, which, as you can see, looks pretty similar to the Proto-Germanic word for eight, Octo. Um, Spanish, it's Ocho, the CT becomes a CH, and that's a normal sound law from Latin to Spanish. Uh, in French, it's huit, and uh, some other things happen there. As you can see, French has a lot of sound laws because it undergoes a lot of mutations. Uh, if we look at the Greek, it's octo, uh, so it's actually very similar to the Latin. We see Latin and Greek being similar a lot of times and agreeing a lot of times. Um, so how are we going to account for this? If your answer is Grimm's Law, you are on the right track. Uh, remember that one of, the, uh, one of the sound changes that happens according to Grimm's Law is that Ks become H's, uh, and that's exactly what happens here. That explains the H as the second letter in the Proto-Germanic word. Uh, that K in Octo became the H in Octo, and that's really, really basic. And once you know Grimm's Law, you can see that right away and pick up on it. But there's another complication here. I'm going to let you look at it for another few seconds and see if you can see a problem before I tell you there is a problem in this Germanic word. If you think back to Grimm's Law and look at what we have going on here, what else should have happened? The other thing that should have happened is that T should have also undergone Grimm's Law. And if you go back to the slide we were looking at, T should have become THUH. So if this word underwent Grimm's Law as we have formulated it so far, it shouldn't be ACTO, it should be ACTHO with a THUH, but that's clearly not what we have. Because in the Germanic languages, this has always been a T, never a THUH, and all the way down to uh, modern English, we have a T at the end, and we don't we, we don't say eighth. That's a totally different word when you're counting seventh, eighth, whatever, right? So, so what's going on with this T? We need another law. Law, this is going to be one of the exceptions to Grimm's Law that we're going to learn about just by looking at the number eight. Um, so here's the law. When an Indo-European word contains two straight stop sounds, like K and T, right in a row, no vowels in the middle or anything like that, only the first one undergoes Grimm's Law. The second one stays the same. Pretty simple, right? So you can see that when you have a consonant cluster like K in the middle of Okto, uh, the K undergoes Grimm's Law and becomes an H, but the T does not undergo Grimm's Law. You can think of it as being protected from Grimm's Law by the presence of the first consonant there. So the T just stays a T, but the K becomes an H in uh, in the Germanic languages. So we think that the Proto-Indo-European word for A was probably just Okto. You can reconstruct some laryngeals in this if you want, if you want, but we don't need to necessarily get into this for our purposes. Let's move on to the number seven. We're going to learn a lot more from the number seven. This is an interesting one. Uh, seven comes from the Proto-Germanic sevun. Not very different. There hasn't been a lot of change here between uh, Proto-Germanic and modern English. As you can see, literally one letter. Um, let's look at our Latin and Greek data. In Latin, the word for seven is septum. So, okay, it looks kind of similar, but there are some things we need to talk about here. Um, of course, Spanish siete and French set both come from the Latin septum with their own sound laws. Uh, in Greek, the word for seven is hepta, uh, which, which uh, looks a little bit different uh, until you realize that there was a sound law in Greek that all S's at the beginning of words change to H's. So hepta used to be septa, and, and once you get back to septa, it looks a, a lot like septum or even seven. Now, 
we still need to talk about what's going on here in the middle of the word. Clearly the word for seven in Proto-Indo-European began with S because they all agree, even Greek, once you know the sound law, agrees that this word began with S in Proto-Indo-European. Uh, how do we deal with the middle of it though? There's something weird going on. Uh, if you think about Grimm's Law, what should happen with Grimm's Law, plus the exception that we just looked at last slide, the P should become an F and the T should stay the same. That's what should happen with Grimm's Law. So we should get something like Seth, Dune, uh, which is not what we get in any of the Germanic languages. We simply don't get that. So we're going to need another law to explain what's happening here because we get this V instead of an F and the T is totally gone. Now I'm just going to go ahead and tell you the T being totally gone is probably just a simplification of the consonant cluster because they didn't want to say ft or as we're going to see more like ft because that's pretty hard to say. So we can just discard the T. There's not really a law there. Let's just discard it. But why do we have a V there instead of an F? That's the real question that I want to answer. And we need to understand another law. This one's going to be a little more complicated. Again, if, 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 you, if you don't want to uh, worry about the particulars, let's just go through it and then you'll see how it works. Uh, Werner's Law is another sound law that happened after Grimm's Law. So Grimm's Law had already happened in the history of Proto-Germanic when Werner's Law happened. It only affected the new th, th, and h, or maybe h, that came from Proto-Indo-European p, t, and k. So it's a particular law that only affects those three new sounds in Proto-Germanic. Uh, not only that, but it only affected them when the sounds were A, not at the beginning of the word, and B, when the stress on the word did not come on the immediately preceding syllable. I know that's a lot to think about, uh, but, but we're going to see it in action here. If all of those conditions were met, the th, th, and h became their voiced fricative variants instead of their voiceless fricative variants. So all you have to do is make the same sound and turn on your vocal cords and you're going to get the voiced fricative. So the voiced variant of F is V. That's all it is. So F became V, th became th, and H or H became R, and that sound was rapidly dealt with because uh, most languages don't like to make that sound. Either way, Werner's Law explains what's going on with the word for seven, because we think that the Proto-Indo-European word for seven was septum, I'm going to go ahead and give it to you here, septum, with the accent on the last syllable, on the m and not on the sept. What this means is that the p in the middle of the word there uh, underwent Werner's Law. So what happens is, first of all, it underwent Grimm's Law, the p became an f, and then according to the conditions of Werner's Law, that f was a, not at the beginning of a word, and b, the accent was not immediately before it, because the accent or stress of the word was actually after it, sept m, not septum, originally. Uh, so it voiced, it became a V instead of an F. So you get from P to F via Grimm's Law, and then you get from F to V via Werner's Law, and that's how you get the V there in the middle of the word in Proto-Germanic. So it all makes sense, but you just have to know some sound laws, and it starts getting a little bit complicated when you dig into these sound laws, but they're really cool once you understand them. All right, let's go on to the number six, and this is going to be the last number that we talk about here in the in, in this particular episode before we take a halftime break. Uh, six is from the Proto-Germanic sex. It might have been sex. Again, that H could have been a H sound, maybe not just an H sound originally. Uh, that's what it comes from, which makes a lot of sense because when we compare it to the Latin and Greek words for six, the Latin word for six was sex. Very similar, clearly undergrows Grimm's Law. K becomes an H uh, instead of six, which is, if you think about an X, it's really just a K plus an S sound together. The K became an H, and so you get the, na the H there in Proto-Germanic. So that makes sense. Spanish, seis, uh, French, seis and Greek uh, hex. Now we see the same sound law in Greek where the S became an H at the beginning of a word. So when you think of a hexagon, it was originally a sexagon, which comes from the word for six, which is also our root for six in English. Now you may be noticing a problem here because even though the Proto-Germanic word had an H in it, today in English we pronounce it K-S with an X. We spell it with an X and not with an H in there at all. So what happened? We need another sound law to account for this. And here it is, another little modification of Grimm's Law that we can learn about just by looking at the numbers. Before S, that H sound that came from the Indo-European K, that was the first stage of Grimm's Law, K became H and later became H, but it would have been H originally. Uh, it probably didn't become H, instead it stayed more of that throaty H sound, and in many languages, including English, it hardened back to a K, because it's actually kind of hard to say sex. It's easier to just say six instead of sex or something like that. So you can see why that might have happened. So when we put all of that together, it all makes sense. And we think that the Proto-Indo-European word for six was probably just sex. Now, sometimes 
some people uh, put a W in there, and there's some reasons for that that we don't need to get into, but there's some other data from within the Indo-European family that make us, makes us think that maybe there was a W there originally, but it doesn't really show up in any of these languages, so we don't need to worry about it. It was either sex or swex was the uh, proto Indo-European word for six. Okay, like I said, uh, we're going to take our break right here. Uh, that was a lot of information we went through. We're going to continue this countdown next episode. See you then.